Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. It has already been four years since I started the series of videos on the stars. Now I wish to return to the topic. With this upcoming series, I hope to illustrate how the liquid metallic hydrogen model of the Sun far surpasses the standard model in easily accounting for different star types and explaining how stars move from one type to another. If you are not familiar with the various star types and how they are classified, a review of these four videos may be helpful. These were meant as an introduction to the topic and this information will be useful as we progress through the analysis of various star types. In moving to the analysis of the stars, let's turn again to the HR diagram and begin with the stars on the main sequence, namely this region of the HR diagram. This covers the old class stars on the upper left all the way down to the M class stars on the lower right and progressing through the B, A, F, G and K class of stars between them. These stars all possess a continuous spectrum as shown in figure 2.1 of the classic text by Gray and Carbali. As one moves towards the upper left of the HR diagram, the peak of the continuous spectrum is moving towards shorter and shorter wavelengths indicating higher and higher apparent photospheric temperatures as determined using Wien's Law. For a review of Wien's Law, just see this video. On the spectra for the G through O class stars, we see the Balmer lines of hydrogen which attain their maximum intensity in the A class stars typically for the A2 classification. The Sun is a G class star and the Balmer lines are clearly seen in its spectrum as can be observed in this collection of spectra from the Paris Observatory. Today we want to review the continuous spectra of the stars and how they are accounted for in the standard model. I discussed the solar spectrum extensively in these three videos. At that time I emphasized that the negative hydrogen ion was thought to be the major contributor to the formation of the spectrum for the Sun in the standard model. I also noted that solar physicists actually use a compilation of numerous processes which are completely unrelated to thermal emission in the laboratory to account for this spectrum. You can learn more about all this in this paper and in reading about solar opacity measurements in this article. Here is what Dr. Basu from Yale had to say about the problem. The opacity contribution from particular elements used in stellar models are the result of complex calculations which are difficult to test directly. However, recent progress at the Z-Machine at Sandia National Laboratories in New Mexico has made it possible to observe plasma under stellar conditions a bid for small amounts of material and for short times. Taisuki Nagayama from Sandia Labs and colleagues have now used the Z-Facility to measure opacities due to iron, chromium and nickel at the high densities and temperatures found in the solar interior. They found large discrepancies between the measured and modeled opacities implying that stellar opacity calculations are far from correct. The results may mean our understanding of the Sun and the stars is less clear than we thought. In reality it is the opacity near the photosphere that matters in order to account for the solar spectrum and that region of the Sun in the standard model has a density of a vacuum at 10 to the minus 7 grams per centimeter cubed. The opacity of something that sparse will never be able to be tested in the Sandia labs. Furthermore, this serves to highlight that astronomers have never measured the opacity of the negative hydrogen ion on which their entire model of solar emission depends. Everything is based on theoretical calculations and is unsupported by experiments. In the end, the opacity of the negative hydrogen ion and all these free ions have absolutely nothing to do with the production of a thermal spectrum on Earth or on the Sun. Conversely, I have stated that the solar spectrum provides the strongest observational evidence that the photosphere has a real lattice as only the presence of a vibrational lattice has ever produced a blackbody spectrum on Earth. Yet if the standard model uses the negative hydrogen ion to account for the bulk of the photospheric spectrum, then how is the continuous spectrum accounted for for other stars? The answer can be found by examining figure 2.12 in Gray and Corbali. In this figure, the opacity at 4500 angstroms is plotted against temperature. 
Note that on this figure, the major source of opacity is provided for different temperatures. For instance, for a star like the Sun with an apparent temperature near 6000 Kelvin, the major contributor to opacity is said to be the negative hydrogen ion bound free interactions, as I just mentioned, along with free free processes. Now look at what happens for other stars. The dominant opacity mechanism for a star with an apparent temperature between 9000 and 12000 Kelvin is hypothesized to be the hydrogen bound free reaction. The negative hydrogen ion is said to play an insignificant role for such stars. If the apparent temperature of the star is even higher, then solar physicists argue that the hydrogen free free reaction starts to dominate, and if still higher in temperature, electron scattering dominates. So in the standard model, the cause of the continuous spectrum depends on different mechanisms for different stars, yet not one of these mechanisms has ever been demonstrated to result in the production of a blackbody spectrum on Earth. So this figure just serves to highlight the unreasonableness of the explanations advanced by the standard model. In the end, all of these mechanisms have to be abandoned as unscientific and without basis. Conversely, I have emphasized that the continuous spectrum of the stars indicates the presence of a real lattice, once again as illustrated in these videos. The idea is that the metallic hydrogen lattice is first formed in the stellar interior where pressures and temperatures are elevated. Once formed, the material can then move to the level of the photosphere where it remains metastable. In these videos, I had highlighted that the photospheric lattice on the Sun must be hexagonal planar type 1 metallic hydrogen, wherein the material acts more like a semi-metal. As we move further into the Sun and enter the convection zone, solar material becomes more compressed and therefore more metallic. I refer to this form as type 2 metallic hydrogen, which is also hexagonal planar and is thought to be a key component of sunspots. Now I have stated that all the stars along the main sequence have a photosphere comprised of type 1 hexagonal planar metallic hydrogen, just like the Sun. That is why these stars are on the main sequence. The stars on the upper left of the main sequence are hot and large, whereas the stars on the lower right are smaller and cooler. However, they all share the ability to emit a blackbody spectrum, and hence, they all share the lattice of the Sun. Stars which are found beyond the main sequence have either a different lattice or have undergone physical changes explained by a lattice. We will return to these concepts in the future. In any event, the question now becomes, why did I advocate for the hexagonal planar lattice? Why not invoke a simple cubic, face-centered cubic, or body-centered cubic structure for the photosphere and the convection zones? Won't other lattices work just as well? The answer is no, and for many reasons. So today, let's talk about the eight lines of evidence which prompted me to adopt a hexagonal planar hydrogen-based lattice in the first place for the main sequence of the stars, and which then served to further justify the elegance of the choice. First, we begin by accepting that the Sun is comprised primarily of hydrogen, as are the main sequence stars. This has been known for over a hundred years and is widely accepted in astronomy. Furthermore, the hydrogen-based nature of the main sequence of the stars is essentially without viable alternatives. These stars are not made of heavy elements as there is no evidence for such a claim. In fact, that is one of the reasons why James Jeans had to abandon his liquid stars as I had outlined in this paper. He had chosen heavy elements and fission to drive his stars, but when it was established that the Sun was primarily composed of hydrogen, he quietly abandoned liquid stars because he had not considered metallic hydrogen as a building block. In any case, it makes sense that the stars are made of the simplest element, both from an evolutionary point of view and from the realization that hydrogen-rich regions are involved in star formation. Second, graphite and soot are the best occurring natural black bodies on Earth, and they possess a hexagonal planar lattice. Lamp black has long been utilized in studying black body radiation, and this goes back to the times well before Kirchhoff. Graphite is still used today at the NISC to build laboratory black bodies, and this is no accident. You can learn more about the use of graphite and soot in the preparation of black bodies in these papers. This provides a powerful incentive to select the hexagonal planar lattice to account for the black body spectrum of the Sun. Third, Professor Neil Ashcroft has stated in this work that the hexagonal planar lattice of metallic hydrogen 
will share the optical properties of graphite with these words. On little reflection, it is apparent that all the qualitative remarks just presented on the band overlap state in dense hydrogen could have been made with minor modifications about graphite, a tetravalent hexagonal band overlap one atmosphere semi-metal. Accordingly, it is instructive to examine the known optical properties of graphite. In the visible range, graphite appears black. To some extent, these characteristics are reported to be shared by very dense hydrogen. One possible choice for the structure of dense hydrogen consistent with hexagonal symmetry is actually a graphite-like arrangement. This is a key realization brought to us by one of the preeminent theoretical condensed matter physicists. It is extremely unlikely that another hydrogen-based lattice will be optically black. Why is that? First, recall that graphite is a semi-metal and that I have argued that type 1 metallic hydrogen would also act as a semi-metal. That is why Ashcroft believed that the hexagonal planar hydrogen would have the optical properties of graphite. Now, the more you compress the hexagonal lattice, the more metallic it will become. In fact, that is why I refer to it as type 2 metallic hydrogen, thought to be observed in sunspots, for instance. In that case, the normal emissivity will drop as the material becomes more metallic. Eventually, as a hydrogen-based lattice becomes even more metallic through further compression, it will become highly reflective like the metals and less emissive at the normal unlike a semi-metal. Compression perhaps leads to different lattice structures, but these should be more metallic and therefore more reflective. Still further compression should lead to something like diamond structure which is fully transparent. That is why the hexagonal planar type 1 metallic hydrogen lattice acting as a semi-metal will be very difficult to replace given what we know about the optical properties of lattices on Earth. Fourth, Wigner and Huntington in their seminal paper on metallic hydrogen concentrated on the body-centered cubic structure but also stated the following. The objection comes up naturally that we have calculated the energy of a body-centered metallic lattice only and that another metallic lattice may be much more stable. We feel that the objection is justified. Of course, it is not to be expected that another simple lattice like the face-centered one have a much lower energy. The energy differences between forms are always very small. It is possible, however, that a layer-like lattice has a much greater heat of formation and is obtainable under high pressure. This is suggested by the fact that in most cases of Table 1 of allotropic modifications, one of the lattices is layer-like. The footnote in the text began, Diamond is a valence lattice, but graphite is a layered lattice. In the abstract of their paper, they state the following. The body-centered modification of hydrogen cannot be obtained with the present pressures, nor can other simple metallic lattices. The chances are better, perhaps, for intermediate, layered-like lattices. Wigner and Huntington understood that the easiest metallic hydrogen lattice one can form will be the layered hexagonal planar lattice. This provides yet more incentive for selecting this lattice first on the sun. Not only is it predicted to have the proper optical properties, but it should also be the easiest to make. Fifth, it is well accepted that the sun must be powered by fusion reactions. This not only solves the problem of energy generation, but it also helps to account for the formation of the elements. Now I have previously addressed lattice confinement fusion in this video and now I wish to highlight another advantage of the hexagonal planar lattice. If lattice confinement fusion is to occur on the sun, we want the protons to be oscillating within a lattice as a result of temperature. Now in the hexagonal planar lattice, the proton vibrations will be preferentially restricted to one plane, namely the hexagonal plane with restricted motion towards other planes. The arrangement of protons now favors internuclear reactions, as protons now can possess preferential oscillation along the internuclear axis. There are potentially very large benefits here, as the proton-proton cross-section for nuclear reactions is known to be extremely small, and internuclear alignment can therefore increase the probability of interaction. This is true for all lattices compared to gases, for instance, but may become even more important when the lattice has a hexagonal planar arrangement. A sixth reason will come for the correct analysis of the microwave background. I have emphasized in this video 
that the hydrogen bonding network in water is essentially hexagonal planar relative to microwave dimensions. Furthermore, the monopole of the microwave background is the best black body ever measured. I have stated that this signal, first measured by Penzias and Wilson, and then measured by the COBE satellite, actually originates from the oceans of the Earth. Again, the signal was never observed far from Earth orbit, and those who point to the WMAP and Planck results never understood what those satellites actually measured. In addition, I have highlighted in this video that the Haruni antenna found no monopole signal in the sky, and Haruni's antenna was designed to prevent any accidental measurement of signal arising from the Earth. In any case, the monopole signal of the microwave background will eventually be reassigned to the Earth. When this occurs, it will provide even more evidence that the hexagonal planar lattice is the correct one to account for the light emitted by the photosphere of the Sun. A seventh reason comes from consideration of solar activity. The hexagonal planar lattice opens up the existence of intercalate regions as my son Christoph first proposed with me in this paper and as we saw in this video. The presence of intercalate zones within hexagonal planar lattices provides for a natural understanding of solar activity including the solar cycle and the presence of the fast solar wind. This has been outlined in these works. For those interested in the electrical properties of stars, it is important to recognize that hexagonal planar material should be conductive in the planes but insulating in the intercalate zones. This can be useful in current flow and dynamo behavior within the Sun. Organized electrical currents require both conductors and insulators. This is a significant advantage in the liquid metallic hydrogen model and the use of the hexagonal planar lattice, which is not shared by other lattices or by the gaseous models. In any event, if an alternative to the hexagonal planar lattice is selected for the photosphere, it will be difficult to account for the activity of the Sun, including the fact that it is sometimes as if a layer of our star is just lifting off when one observes coronal mass ejections. This is facilitated if a hexagonal planar structure is used as the interaction between planes is relatively weak. Once again, this is an advantage not shared by other lattices. These videos provide dramatic illustrations that the Sun has a layered structure at the level of the photosphere. An eighth reason stems from consideration of the life cycle of the stars. When intercalate regions are introduced, there are significant consequences. Much of the behavior of the stars can be easily explained based on what we observe on Earth in the laboratory. The idea that intercalate regions can rapidly expand may be applied and increase our understanding of objects such as red giants and supernova. We will return to these star types in future videos. Compare the simplicity of these ideas to those of the standard model where stellar behavior is either unaccounted for or requires a suspension of disbelief for acceptance. Lattice structure can be a key determinant of the behavior of an object on Earth, and this will also be true for the stars. So to recap, in the metallic hydrogen solar model, stars on the main sequence of the HR diagram are related to the Sun in that they share the same lattice. This is how one can account for the light which they emit. Stars which lie outside the main sequence have undergone lattice changes either through expansion of intercalate zones as seen in giants or nova or through dramatic changes in lattice structure as will be discussed when we address the white dwarfs. I also discussed eight reasons why the hexagonal planar lattice is the proper choice for the photosphere of the Sun. These include the following. No other lattice structure will come close to yielding its advantages, both for understanding the solar spectrum and in accounting for solar and stellar behavior. Once again, it is only a matter of time until the monopole of the microwave background is reassigned. After all, how long can those who are interested in climate change or oceanography allow the cosmologists to have misassigned a signal which actually belongs to the Earth? When that signal is reassigned, the consequences will be clear. The Sun will be understood to be condensed matter, and modern astrophysics will undergo tremendous paradigm shifts. Since the Sun is the Rosetta Stone of astronomy, it is not possible to alter our understanding of its nature without altering the entire discipline. This includes how we treat 
all of stellar evolution, including whether or not black holes or the Big Bang can exist. Of course, when it becomes evident that the Sun and the stars are comprised of condensed matter, others will come forward to advance their own understanding of possible lattice types, and astrophysics is likely to face a vast array of suggestions. However, I remain confident that the correct lattice has indeed already been selected. In my opinion, other choices will fall far short of the advantages offered by the hexagonal planar lattice for the photosphere of the Sun and the stars of the main sequence. In closing, I hope that you enjoyed the discussion today. Do continue to support me through your views and likes, and subscribe if you can. Promote the channel with your friends and your local astronomy club, and stick with me as we look more closely at the Sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are welcome down below, and I will see you soon on the next video.